morning. Recently, I was reading a white paper which was describing or comparing two application platforms, one developed in C++ and one developed in Java. And they went piece by piece comparing the two. And when they got to garbage collection, they described garbage collection as a programmer convenience. And they counted the number of lines of code in the C++ system that was explicitly disposing of memory and concluded that that was a very small percentage of the entire code base, and therefore garbage collection was not a significant convenience and should not be considered in comparing these two systems, which was completely wrong, because that's not what garbage collection is. It's not a program or convenience. It's a reliability mechanism. It's a way of guaranteeing that a, a, a large, important class of dangling pointer errors cannot occur. And it's only when you have garbage collection that you can consider a very rich uh, family of algorithms which are just too dangerous to consider without it. So basically the conclusion of the paper was that it was okay for C++ programmers to be completely ignorant about Java. And that's just wrong. And we'll come back to that later. It's never good to be ignorant about anything. Um, but today we're going to be talking about loops. This is a loop statement. Um, we don't have a statement quite like this in JavaScript where you've got loop and you've got a block and you do the things in the block uh, over and over again. I kind of wish we did for a couple of reasons. One is um, most of my loops seem to exit out of the middle. The, you know, the book says you're supposed to always exit out of the top or the bottom and JavaScript has conveniences for that, but I tend to break out of the middle. Um, and you can write that in JavaScript using while true or for semicolon, semicolon, but they both look stupid. Um, I'd rather have a fundamental thing because that's ultimately what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to go around and around. Um, but the, the more important reason is it allows us to have sort of a smaller core language and then express higher level things in terms of that. Brendan gave us an example of that last night with the meta object stuff. Um, that sort of takes some of the magic out of the language and allows more of the language to be developed in itself. And another approach to doing a, the same thing is to have uh, simple primitives, which then could be syntactically expanded or desugared into uh, more expressive patterns. For example, a while statement um, could be transformed into the equivalent loop statement. And in looking at that, it suddenly realize while doesn't actually accomplish very much. You, I, I wouldn't miss having it. Uh, similarly, uh, we've got do while, which looks completely different, but we can see its expansion to loop, it's just the same thing except the if is on the bottom now. Um, hello? We've got the for statement, uh, which confuses beginners learning the, the language because you've got these three clauses and it seems really arbitrary which is which. Uh, the equivalent uh, loop statement is pretty easy to understand. Now, another way that you could think about loops is to turn them into recursive functions. So here I'm turning a while into a function that calls itself and continues to call itself until a condition is met. Um, this doesn't quite work in JavaScript right now for two reasons. One is um, the body uh, cannot be, or the, the body of the loop, which is a block, can't be turned into a function body if it contains this or arguments or return or break or continue. Um, so you, it's sort of a special case. But the more important restriction is that JavaScript does not currently implement tail recursion optimization. So you'll run out of stack space uh, in most cases before this loop concludes. And I'd like to get that fixed someday too. We'll come back to that. So the, the main loop I'm here to talk about today is the uh, event loop. The event loop is the most important of all loops. Um, so the, the browser has an event queue which contains callback functions. And those uh, functions get triggered by the timer on set timeout or set interval, uh, by UI events, clicking and mousing and keyboarding, and by the network, on load and, and other things. Um, in, a, in an event loop driven system, which the browser is, everything happens in turns. So at the beginning of a turn, an event handler gets started, it will run to completion, and then the next turn happens. And within your turn, you can be confident that um, 
you'll never get interrupted, so you don't have to worry about anything else kind of spoiling the environment uh, while your turn is going on. Now that puts a, uh, a huge restriction on the use of the system, which is uh, you've got a prime directive. In a turn, you must never block, you must never wait, and you must finish fast, because everything else in the system is waiting for you to complete. Nothing else can go until you're done. Um, the event loop is one of the best parts of the browser. There are lots of things that the browser got wrong. This is one of the parts that the browser got brilliantly right, uh, with a couple of exceptions. There, um, Alert and its sisters um, block, and so they're okay to use for debugging, but they should never be used in applications because they stop the, the main browser thread so no other work can happen until the user dismisses it. Um, also, XHR was created with a synchronous mode which blocks you while you're waiting for the network to return a result, which is terrible. So you should never, ever be using that either. But with those restrictions, the browser got all of the asynchronous uh, operations for the event loop correctly. Um, being a mathematician, she thought she'd be assigned to code breaking. Instead, she was sent to Harvard <clears throat> to work on the um, Mark I. Uh, it um, was a, a, a computer operated by the Navy <clears throat> so when, <clears throat> excuse me. When she got there, her first assignment was to take the machine apart, figure out how it worked, figure out how to program it, and then write the manual so that other people could program it. So she was one of the very first programmers. And she completed that task very successfully. Um, after the war, she went to work for the first um, commercial computer manufacturer, which built the UNIVAC. Um, at that time, and for a long time, uh, computers were extremely expensive. They were millions of dollars. Um, and the development of software was extremely slow and difficult. Basically, programs were written as a sequence of numeric codes. Um, it was just very, very tedious work. And the thinking at the time was that um, the hardware costs were going to dwarf the software costs, because human life is cheap by comparison to vacuum tubes. Um, so we'll just throw as many people as, at it as we need in order to make all the software that's required. She had the insight that that wasn't going to work, that um, programming was just too difficult, and finding enough amazing people like you to do that level of work for the UNIVAC, um, they were not going to be able to sell enough machines to make the business go. So she had this amazing idea, of we can use software to make it easier to write software. So she developed a program called A0, um, which was the first in the A series. Sort of an indication of how smart a programmer she was, she called it A0. She didn't call it A1. It was the first compiler. She called it a compiler. We call things compilers today because of A0. Uh, her, her idea was to have a library of subroutines and that you could call for those subroutines and assemble them into a program. Um, and then the program that you assembled could also go into the subroutine library and other people could build on that. Um, the reason we call a collection of useful software a library is because of this. Um, the reason we call a function, uh, you know, why do you call a function? A function isn't anything like a telephone call. It's because of the library metaphor that you call for a book. Every book has a call number. You can call for the, the document and get it. That's the sense she had. Um, so there were two kinds of subroutines in her system. Uh, open subroutines, which today we would call and include. You just take the whole text of the subroutine and stick it right in the middle. And then a, a new idea, the closed subroutine, which you could jump to and then jump back. So you could use it from multiple places in your program, but it only occurs once in memory. So in modern terms, A0 was more like a linker or, or a, a loader than it was a compiler. But this was the first compiler, and it went through iterations which eventually led to modern programming languages. Um, a, a later evolution uh, was A2. A2 was the first open source project. A2 was given to Univac's customers, and they used it, and some of them modified it and gave back the changes and suggestions for, for further improvement. Um, open source is almost as old as computers, but not quite. Uh, the thing it had to wait for was mass production. Um, prior to UNIVAC, every computer was one-off. Um, they'd build it mostly as a research project. 
Um, and as a result of having built it, they figured out how to build the next one better. So it wasn't until UNIVAC that you had lots of people using similar machines, and then open source becomes a reasonable thing. A2 led to A3, which led to AT3, which was later renamed as Mathematic. It was one of the first programming languages that we would recognize today as a programming language. About the same time, IBM developed Fortran, which turned out to be the winner in, in this particular race. Um, now, it turns out um, Fortran made programmers much, much uh, more productive. But some of the best programmers of the day completely rejected that idea. Uh, they said that programming took too much creativity and dexterity uh, for the human being to be replaced by the very machine they were manipulating. Wow. Um, they just didn't understand what it was that Fortran was supposed to be doing for them, that it's going to make them more productive, make their lives better. And this is going to be a recurring theme, that very often programmers are the last to understand the, the benefit of an improvement in software technology. So one of the characteristics in both Mathmagic or Mathematic and Fortran was blocking read and blocking write. So when you got to a read statement, the program would stop. Um, it would then go off to the card reader, the tape drive, or wherever it was getting the data, because the program had nothing to do until it got the data anyway. So it would just block until the I.O. operation was completed. Um, the model for I.O. In, in the early programming languages was sort of based on the black box hardware model where you've got an input and an output, and you do some processing in between. When we went to time sharing, um, the, uh, that model just came right along. So you had read and write statements that now talked to teletypes and interactive devices. So programs became highly modal, because at each read statement, the program would be expecting one particular input, and the user couldn't type anything else at that point, or it would be an error. So the flow of the dialogue was dictated by the program, not by the user. And so the programs were significantly harder to use than today's programs. Um, time sharing uh, economically depended on the blocking read, because while a, a one task was stopped on a read, that time could be given to other users. And so that's how they, they had a machine that was much slower than the device you've got in your pocket, and it'd be shared over 100 people. Um, and that was how they gave the illusion that um, People were getting more time than they actually got. Um, so since then, virtually all programming languages have had blocking I.O. Every language has read and write, with only a couple of exceptions. Um, C had no I.O. at all, which was actually an amazing advance, because it made the language much more flexible. You could use it in lots of different environments, including embedded systems, where you had completely different notions of how I.O. was supposed to work. Unfortunately, it also came with standard I.O., and that's pretty much the only thing uh, people use. So effectively, it has blocking I.O. Um, meanwhile, um, some people were start starting to recognize that there were other ways of managing I.O., which, which were much more effective. This was happening particularly in research labs, like at uh, Stanford Research Institute and at Xerox PARC. Also, uh, people developing text editors started coming up with the notion that if you had just one read statement for the entire editor, that gave the user a lot more flexibility in how they can enter their commands. Um, also, people who were developing uh, the earliest computer games also made the same discovery, that they would never wanted to block on I.O., that um, they just wanted to have one particular place where they could get stuff and change the state of the program based on what was entered. Um, that didn't reach, that idea didn't reach mainstream programmers until 1984. Um, and in 1984, Macintosh, was, which was the first reasonably priced uh, computer based on an event model, uh, became available. And a lot of programmers uh, looked at it and couldn't figure out how to program it. Um, they complain that you have to write the programs inside out. Wah. It's just too hard. It's impossible to think about it. Uh, so we should go back to the command line. That's the way God intended us to write programs, that this kind of inside-out stuff is just wrong. Um, Apple released uh, a program called Mac App, which was a skeleton of a Macintosh application, which had the event loop built into it and affordances for creating menu bars and all the other things you have to do. You just had to plug your code into that. Uh, 
they weren't buying it. It was still way too hard to think about. So event loop programming might have died out at that point, except for HyperCard. Bill Atkinson, who developed QuickTime or QuickDraw and MacPaint, uh, wrote a multi-level MacPaint in which you could have many planes of imagery uh, available, and you could switch from one to another. And each of those planes, in addition to having uh, pixels on it, could also have buttons and fields, and those buttons and fields could have script attached to it. And the whole thing was event-driven, and it really took off. Uh, because non-programmers found that they could be incredibly productive in HyperCard. They'd just draw a picture of something and add a little bit of script to, to make it work, and boom, they had an application, and people were developing all sorts of things. Um, and then the professional programmers kind of looked at what the amateurs were doing and going, okay, yeah, I guess we could do that too. And then suddenly there was an explosion in, in programs for the Macintosh and for Windows, which has a similar model. So HyperCard was all about events. Um, it was so event-oriented that you didn't have to write the event loop yourself. It was built in. So all you had to write was event handlers. Uh, so programs, which it called stacks, were written as a collection of event handlers attached to visible objects, cards, fields, and buttons. Um, and uh, events bubbled up, as they do in the browser. Um, and some of the event names may look very familiar to you, like uh, on mouse up, on key down, on Card enter in the browser became on load. You all remember that. Um, on idle was an event that it sent out whenever there was nothing going on. When the event queue became empty, it would send on idle. People figured out that they could do animation with that, um, which worked fine for the first generation of Macintoshes. But when the next generation came out, which was faster, all the animation went crazy. So. Uh, uh, HyperCard didn't anticipate that people would be animating with it because uh, the CPUs at that time were so slow that wasn't really an option, but people did it anyway. Um, so the lesson was if you don't provide a right way, the street will find its own way. And we've certainly seen that played over and over in the browser. Um, so HyperCard had a big impact on the, on the evolution of the browser. Basically, Netscape Navigator 2 was combining ideas from HyperCard and combining ideas from the original web browser. Uh, and it turns out that JavaScript is really well suited to this model, and that's not by coincidence, because JavaScript was designed specifically to do this, and it's actually very, very good at it. So the DOM is awful. I, I, I hope I'm not surprising anybody. Any, anybody not aware that the DOM is awful? Um, but as awful as it is, uh, with JavaScript, the DOM is really effective. Um, and if you put an AJAX library on it, like YUI3, it becomes really effective, almost pleasant. So one of the reasons why JavaScript is really good at this, and one of the reasons why you are really good at this, is because JavaScript does not have read. It's one of the only modern programming languages, one of the only programming languages in the history of programming languages that doesn't have blocking read built into it. Um, this has always been seen as a big disadvantage. Oh, JavaScript's awful because you can't read files with it. But that turns out to have been a good thing because it means it's easier for you to work with the event-driven model than it is for people who have practice with other languages because you've never blocked. And so the, the urge to want to have to block and to find alternatives to it is not a problem for you. You've always done it right. Um, and you know, read is, is a problem in this model because read blocks, and blocking is bad for event loops. So JavaScript programmers are smarter about using event loops than programmers of other languages. So congratulations, you're all smarter. Um, so the event loop is just one approach to concurrency. Uh, we have a need to do lots of things at the same time. Event loops are one way to do that. Another is to use threading, and threading is the most popular approach of uh, most programmers today. So um, everything's a trade-off. Nothing is perfect in technology. So let's look at the, the trade-offs with threading. On the pro side, no rethinking is necessary. So you don't have to write your programs inside out. You can take any sequential program, put it in a thread, and it still works. So that's a huge advantage. Uh, those programs can block. In fact, they're supposed to block. The reason we have threads isn't so we can do multiple things at once, it's so that we can stop doing things and do other things while that's still going on. 
Um, so con execution will continue as long as any thread is not blocked. On the con side, um, you have to allocate stack memory for each thread. Um, that was a problem once, it's not a problem now because memory is so abundant. Um, a, a bigger problem is that if two threads use the same memory, a race may occur. And that is a big problem. Um, so uh, here we've got uh, two JavaScript programs. Each is only one line long. Each is going to run in its own thread. And they're both going to run concurrently at the same time. So what would be the result of this program? Uh, one possible result would be the array A and B. And the other would be the array B or A. Does everybody see how that could happen? Because either of those threads could happen first, and so you can't predict ahead of time which is going to win. Um, but that's not the big problem. The big problem is that um, there are two other cases that could occur where after you run that program, you've got just A or you've got just B. That data has been lost. Um, a hazard in thread programming is anytime you have a read, modify, write, which is basically all we do, uh, there's a chance for collision. So you can think of threads as being cars, uh, or, but they're invisible cars. So they can't see each other, but if they're ever in the same place at the same time, they crash. So let, let me show you what went on here. So when we append something to the end of an array, we can do that in one statement in JavaScript, but what actually happens could be viewed as several statements. Um, and so each of those threads has those statements, and they could be interleaved in any possible way. There's no way to predict how they're going to get interleaved. And in this case, with this particular interleaving, um, the result is B, because A gets clobbered. The last guy to write to uh, the length uh, wins. Uh, and this is terrible. Um, uh, you, you know, you, you couldn't look at that program and see, you know, what happened? Why did our data disappear? How did we become inconsistent? How did we become insecure, unreliable? Um, it's about all you could do is say, oh, you're using threads. There's your problem. Um, so it's impossible to have application integrity when subject to race conditions. Um, now, there's a solution to race conditions, and it's called mutual exclusion. So you can take some critical section of code, some set of statements, or some data structures, and say only one thread is able to have access to this at a time. Um, and this uh, has several names. It's sometimes called the semaphores, or monitors, or rendezvous. In Java, it's called synchronization. All of these things are pretty much equivalent. This used to be operating system stuff. Um, only people writing operating systems ever cared about this. Application programmers were always uh, exempt from it. But it has leaked into application space because of networking, um, because the delays now of going over the network can be really long. And so uh, having blocking I.O. over the network is intolerable. And also because of the multi-core problem, that we have lost the ability to make CPUs go faster. So to make systems go faster, we have more CPUs. Um, and so now it's up to the application developers to take advantage of that in order to make the machines go faster, because the hardware guys have given up. Um, and it turns out to be really hard. Keeping m multiple CPUs busy all at the same time with one application is something that is still an unsolved problem. Uh, but you're expected to, to do that. Um, so under mutual uh, exclusion, only one thread can be executing in a critical section at a time. Um, and other threads that are waiting to execute in the critical section are blocked. Um, you know, if the threads don't interact, then the programs run at full speed. But if they do interact, then races will occur unless mutual uh, exclusion is employed. But then there's another problem. There's the deadlock problem, where you've got uh, two or more threads which are waiting for another thread to complete before they can proceed, and somehow they get into this deadly embrace where they're waiting on each other. Uh, a real-world example of this would be uh, gridlock, uh, where you've got a bunch of cars that all went into the intersection at the same time. This is Sao Paulo, Brazil, about two blocks from the Yahoo office. Um, 
they're all stuck. Everybody's waiting for everybody else. This is deadlock. So you don't want your programs doing this. And it turns out when you're doing threads and synchronization, deadlock is really easy to cause. And it's very difficult to reason about. Um, so deadlock occurs when threads are waiting on each other. Races and deadlocks are really hard to think about. Um, they are the most difficult problems to identify, debug, and correct. One of the things that makes them so hard is you can't predict when they're going to occur. And once they've occurred, they may be impossible to recreate. So they're the worst possible kinds of bugs. So managing sequential logic, which is what we do, is hard. Managing temporal logic is really, really hard. And there are not many people who can do that well. Um, so uh, going back to the cons, if, if two threads use the same memory, a race may occur. Um, and that's actually worse than saying a race will occur. Because if it, if it does occur predictably, then you can find it and fix it. Um, but it, it may be that uh, the temporal signature of your program is really different under test than it is in production. Uh, so it may work really well in development, but it fails when you show it to your investors, or, or it works really well in, in the early stage, but fails when you start to scale, or it fails when you're showing it to the M&A guys from Megacorp. Um, they tend to go wrong at the worst possible time. Uh, there's some overhead in thread management. that It doesn't come for free. There's the threat of deadlock, which will just uh, uh, kill threads and could possibly cascade to kill other threads, eventually strangling the whole system. Thinking about uh, reliability is extremely difficult. Um, and ultimately, what we have is system application confusion. In, in my view, the biggest design error in Java was that it couldn't make up its mind if it wanted to be a systems language or an application language. In a systems language, you have to have threads. In an application language, you should never have threads. Um, but because they tried to, to bridge both, they require use of threads at the application level, and I think that's deadly. Fortunately, there is a, a good alternative to, um, to threading, and that is um, that uh, and that alternative completely avoids all the reliability hazards of threads. And that is the event loop, our friendly event loop. It, it actually does all of the stuff better. So again, there are trade-offs. Um, the pro is that it's completely free of races and deadlocks, which is a huge, huge advantage. You can be much more reliable. Turns out you can also be much more efficient. Um, there's only one stack which gets reused on every turn. Uh, that saves memory, but again, that's not important anymore. Uh, very low overhead. Um, you, you don't have task switching. You're not uh, uh, doing memory faults. You're not doing any of uh, thread locking, all that expensive stuff. You're just doing computation as fast as the machine can go. All of the idle time has been squeezed out, so you can just have pure computation, the thing that computers do best. And it's resilient. If any turn fails, the program can still go on. Whereas in a thread-based system, if any stack fails, um, there's a chance that that may cause cascading failure of other threads as well. Now, it comes with some cons. Uh, the cons are that the program must never block. You have to obey the prime directive. Um, you have to program inside out, wah, but again, you're, you're good at this. Um, and turns must finish quickly. And this is probably the most important restriction. It says that not all applications are well suited to running as event loops. Uh, but it turns out a very large class of applications are. So for long-running tasks, like if you have to factor pi um, in your web application, which is not something most of us have to do, uh, there are two solutions for managing that. One is to use a technique called iteration, um, in which we break the task into multiple turns and keep resubmitting those turns to the event queue. For example, you could have um, a process in which uh, you do one step of the computation, then do a set timeout of zero, passing in the function which will cause the next step in that computation to happen. And you just keep doing that until it finishes. Now, that could end up taking a very long time, but each turn will be very short. And so the liveliness of the system is maintained and all is good. Um, the other uh, thing you can do is move the task into a separate process or a worker. And, and that's a brilliant thing, too. One of the advantages of workers is there's no requirement that they actually be in the same machine. Um, so we could send them across the network, and you know, wherever we've got spare capability, we can, we can put them. And so 
that becomes a really powerful model. And in the event-driven system, being fully distributed uh, comes as a fallout. Um, uh, another approach people take to doing I.O. In, in programming languages over the network is the remote procedure call, which combines two great ideas, functions and networking, and produces a really bad idea. Um, like read, it attempts to isolate programs from time, um, but the effect of that is that the program blocks, blacks out. It, it, it has last, lost time. So when you're reading the program, it's very difficult by design, by intention, to see where it is that time is being lost because the, uh, the blocking network calls are made to look like local function calls so you just can't see where the time is going. Um, and that can result in a very terrible experience for the user because they see, you know, the, the program blacks out and so the user is going, hey, are you dead? Hello? And, and that's, it's rude and disrespectful. We, we should never do that to, to human beings. But it's hard to avoid doing that when, when you've got a remote procedure call. Um, so we should be doing the opposite. We should be doing latency compensation. We want to give the user feedback as early as possible to let them know we're, we, we're listening to you, we're, we're working for you, we're trying to do things. Uh, we don't ever want to lock up uh, the browser or the client while we're waiting for the network to do anything. In some applications, the client can predict what the server's response is going to be and go ahead and do it um, so that the user gets immediate feedback. And if it turns out that uh, the prediction was incorrect, then correct it later. For example, if you have a, a game or a chat application being played over the net, um, you know, the user makes a move. And locally, you can determine that it's a valid move or, or if it's just a chat message. Um, go ahead and display it as though it was accepted. Um, in a few seconds, you'll get the feedback from the server telling you whether that happened or not. And if it did, then you can ignore that, and if it didn't, then you correct it. Um, so uh, security is always important, and, and you really can't have security if you don't have reliability, and we don't have reliability when we have threads. So we have a much more secure model uh, with the event loop. Now, just having event loops does not guarantee that you're going to be secure. Uh, for example, uh, the browser is an event loop driven system, and we're subject to cross-site scripting attacks which is uh, terrible. This is the worst problem that we have in the browser. Uh, Cross-site scripting has two causes. Um, the sharing of the global object, so every piece of script, no matter where it comes from, gets in the same global object, which gives it all the same privileges that your own site does, including the ability to uh, interact with the entire document, to talk to the user. Uh, if the user is looking at the anti-phishing Chrome, the Chrome will say, yeah, it's legit. Uh, gives you the ability to uh, talk to the server. If, if there's an SSL connection, you get access to the SSL, SSL connection. You get access to all the cookies, everything. Really terrible. Um, there's also misinterpre misinterpretation of HTML. HTML is such a complicated language with other languages inside of it that it's very difficult to determine if a piece of code is going to be safe. Tragically, HTML5 ignores and worsens the XSS problem. Um, and recently, the uh, HTML5 editor said that HTML5 uh, doesn't ever have markup injection vulnerabilities, which is wrong, completely wrong. Um, so we can't expect help from W3C. They're, they're apparently not even aware that there's a problem, uh, not understanding the problem. They're unlikely to ever give us a solution. So the browser is a loaded gun aimed at your head. And that's what pulls the trigger. Um, so page templates um, are, are, you know, like PHP, ASP, JSP, all those Ps, used to be a good way to develop web applications. But it, um, there, there are some problems with them now. That one is that the, a template is too rigid a framework, that we're now building extremely dynamic pages out of lots of components coming from lots of different places and putting them all into a, a simple template really doesn't work very well. Um, but worse than that, it's way too easy to insert text into a context where it might be misinterpreted and executed, um, completing an XSS attack. So can we do better by using JavaScript on the server? Um, there are some obvious advantages to being 
uh, server-side JavaScript. One is that we can take advantage of our new understanding of JavaScript. That it turns out JavaScript is a powerful expressive programming language, and we can apply that to server-side programming as well. Um, now it turns out this is not a new idea. Netscape offered a server-side JavaScript product in 1996, and it was awful. Um, it used, um, it was modeled after PHP, so it had a server tag in which, which looked like a script tag, except it was script that was going to run on the server side, and it had a write function for inserting stuff into the outgoing HTML stream. It's just like document write, except on the server, just as bad. Um, so it had all the disadvantages of the other page templating system, and at the time, really slow JavaScript engines. Um, so what if we did it right? What if we modeled the server side using the same things that we learned work so well on the client side? What if we had an event loop in the server? Um, and it turns out that's what Node.js is. And there, there are other people doing similar stuff. Node.js is the, the front runner right now and, and is really well worth looking at. So Node.js implements a web server in a JavaScript event loop. It is a high performance event pump. It takes the event queue and pulls things out and, and does them really fast. It optimizes the event loop dispatch. You can get a lot of work done very quickly. All of the overhead is squeezed out, so the event queue is just pure computation. Um, it got read right. So uh, file system read takes a callback, so it doesn't block, which is perfect. That's exactly how read should work. Um, everything in the Node.js API is non-blocking except there are some synchronous functions which do block. They're non-blocking versions, but there shouldn't be anything that blocks. And also require is blocking. I think that was a mistake as well. It, the model really requires that everything be non-blocking. But other than that, Node.js seems to have gotten everything right. So one of the advantages of, of this is that you can run your code on both sides of the network. So we have YUI 3 now running on Node.js with a, a pseudo DOM. So we can now run exactly the same code in both places. Um, and we can take advantage of, of YUI's communication manager on the server to go out and talk to, say, 10 different services, which are going to send back data, uh, which will get assembled into your page. And we can make all of those requests simultaneously. And so uh, the net cost is the max of all of those requests, whereas in PHP, the net cost is going to be the sum of all those requests, which is going to be a much larger number. Now, it turns out in PHP, you can do it uh, the hard way, but nobody wants to do hard in PHP, right? That, that's, that's not what it's for. Uh, whereas in JavaScript, under YUI, it is easy. Uh, you just wait for all the event handlers, or all, all the callbacks to fire, and once they've all fired, on with the show. So it's, it's really brilliant. Also, we're finding that um, we've, we've got a really nice fallback story now. So uh, we can, if we sense we're, the, the browser is a piece of crap, like I don't say for random IE6, um, <laughs> and we're tired of supporting IE6, we can run it all on the server and just send them page views. Um, or if we decide that our startup is taking too long because we've got a huge amount of code, we might want to do the first view on the server um, so that people can be looking at that while the rest of the script is loading on the browser. We can do that as well. You don't have to write everything two or three times to accomplish all those things. You only have to write it once. And with a good library under you, it, it just works. So we've got a lot of mobility, a lot of flexibility. Uh, so good stuff there. Um, looking a little deeper, looking at the network itself, uh, we've got this stack of protocols. Uh, at the bottom, we've got IP, which can deliver a, a packet from any computer in the world to any other computer in the world almost all the time, which is an amazing thing. Then on top of that, we've got uh, TCP, which provides sessions, reliability, uh, pa uh, packet reordering, which is good stuff. Then we've got HTTP, which is really a document delivery protocol, which is stateless. Then on top of that, we're trying to do messaging in AJAX, but we have to do it on top of H um, HTTP, which has a lot of inefficiency in it, and it wants to be stateless, but we really want to be stateful because we're, we're doing session applications. And so it would be really nice if we could just get rid of 
HTTP and run Ajax on top of TCP. I don't think we're ever going to be able to do that because there's so much arthritis sort of built into the network now with you know, all the various proxy servers and firewalls and stuff like that. That'll probably never work, which is really a shame. So let's sort of go back to the beginning of time. Uh, so first there was a, a browser and there was a server. And the browser makes requests to the server and, and documents go back. Um, then we got to the point where um, the demand on the server was so large that a single server couldn't do it anymore. So there are various implementations of having some kind of distributor which goes in front of the site, which can then direct traffic maybe on a round robin or least used or whatever basis uh, to other servers that will actually do the work. And then they all go to a common database. And initially that tends to be some kind of SQL machine. And if you're at all successful, that's going to fail because um, it, it won't scale big enough to, to, to meet what you have to do. Um, so you do tricks to make SQL scale. You'll, you'll uh, splinter it or, or do other things which violate the relational model, but you don't have to rethink anything. And that, that turns out to be the most important thing. Um, the, uh, the other approach is to consider a, a no SQL database. And I love these things. So we've got like Couch and, and Mongo and a whole bunch of others. Uh, which are just acting brilliantly there. It turns out Yahoo has had a massive uh, homegrown NoSQL database in production since 1996. Um, so uh, these are really good things. So then we put Ajax on top of this, and now in addition to the persistent state that you want to keep in the database, you've got ephemeral session state, um, you know, which is sort of stuff that you're talking about that isn't ready to commit yet. Where do you put that stuff? Um, in this model where you have the distributor, uh, you can't keep it in the servers because each request might end up going to a different server. Uh, so you end up having to put this ephemeral information in the database, which is maybe the worst place in the universe where you want to put it. Um, an another approach to that is uh, something that you see in the Elko server, um, developed by Chip Morningstar, in which the browser connects initially to a session director, and the session director will then appoint some server to be the place where the session will live. And from that point on, the browser connects only to that particular server. That server can then keep its ephemeral state in the most efficient place in the world, which is in JavaScript variables, which are enclosures bound to the event handlers in the event queue in the server. Um, so that the overhead for getting at at session state is zero. It's absolutely free. There's no API for getting that stuff because it's just in variables. Uh, so it's extremely ex efficient. Um, so um, I, I was talking to a, a good friend of mine recently, a really smart guy, about uh, JavaScript and what we might do with it. And I was talking about how I would like to see us implement the um, tail recursion optimization that I talked about earlier um, in the language that would allow us to do uh, uh, recursion for looping, which would uh, ha have some efficiency benefits. Also would allow us to have new styles of programming available, such as continuation passing style. Um, and his answer to that was that he'd never used continuation passing style, so he didn't see the value of it. Um, and I immediately recognized that as a stupid answer. And I knew it was a stupid answer because I have made that same stupid argument many times in my career. And I've been hearing that same stupid stuff uh, as long as I've been a programmer. I've, I've heard that argument used to explain why we shouldn't do event programming, why we shouldn't use high-level languages, um, uh, why we don't need recursion, why we don't need closure and functions. You know, I don't understand it, never needed it. Uh, what good is it? Um, I can do my job perfectly well without knowing any more than what I know. And that's a really dangerous thing. So when uh, Grace Hopper, or we've, we've come a long way in software engineering since Grace Hopper started us on the road of using software to develop software. And we have a long way yet to go. And in my view, um, we should be a lot farther along by now than, than we are. And I think it's mainly because we get in our own way, that basically to take the next step forward, we have to wait for a generation of programmers to die off. 
uh, before we can get critical mass of, of, of brains on the powerful new idea to go forward. And we're now in this really in interesting position where we're about to take the next step forward in, in application development, and the language which is leading the way is JavaScript, which is amazing. JavaScript has transformed from this horrible little language that we can barely tolerate to a language which we're embracing and is now leading everyone else. Um, so, um, show of hands. <laughs> Anybody have any strong? Yeah. Uh, let's try one more. What do you think of this? <laughs> All opposed? I, I, I see two or three hands. Okay. How about that one? Now, how about this one? I think it is too soon to call. I see Microsoft doing some really good work on IE9. And I've seen some applications which are running better on IE9 than on any other browser. So uh, kudos to Microsoft for that. Uh, but then we got that bombshell last night when uh, uh, Pete from Microsoft told us that they don't intend to implement all of ECMAScript 5 and that standards compliance is apparently not important to them. Um, I'm really distressed by that. So in my view, the only web standard that matters is the ECMAScript standard. Because um, the DOM is crap, right? Does everybody, everybody knows that. The standards for the DOM are crap. It's always been crap. Uh, we have terrible portability, terrible reliability. It's at the wrong level of abstraction. Everything about it is wrong. Um, but with JavaScript, somehow we've made it work. JavaScript is sort of the ultimate workaround tool. Whatever crap the browser can throw at us, we can manage it with JavaScript. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that JavaScript actually got a lot of stuff right. It's actually a brilliant language, despite its, its defects. You know, deep down, there is brilliance in the core of the language. The other thing is that it's extremely portable, that um, if you stick to the core part of the language, you know, the, sort of the JSLint subset of the language, it runs everywhere. It, it keeps the write once run everywhere promise that Java failed to keep. Um, and so that's why it's so distressing that Microsoft is now saying that standards compliance with the only web standard that matters is no longer important. Um, now, they haven't shipped IE9 final yet, so there's still time for Microsoft to do it right. Um, I, I hope that they will. So on that optimistic note, thank you and good night. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, Tom, will, Tom, are you demonstrating? Or, Tom, are you here? Tom Croucher, are you in the room? Oh, okay. Oh, there you are. So are, are you talking about this this afternoon? Okay, uh, so are you going to be talking about the ability using YUI 3 on Node.js? You're not talking about that? Oh, okay, so don't go to his talk. <laughs> anyway, we have a demonstration of, uh, uh, for example, we've got a calendar widget in YUI. Um, and you, you run YUI 3 in the browser and you can click on a date and the date opens up and so on. Uh, you can do exactly the same thing on the server side uh, using exactly the same code. Um, you just uh, configure it so that instead of that you take the thing that it, it created on the server side, serialize it, taking its inner HTML and sending that to the browser instead. Um, so with a, you know, just a, a little bit of, of, of new library code, 
you can have your application run on either side of the network, or, or on both. Or um, you could also set up your application as a web service, so that if it's called in a particular way, instead of building a page view, it only builds a div, which it could then transport. So it becomes much more flexible. We, we used to have to, um, if we want to get something like this, have to write the application several times. And now we only have to write it once. Uh, anyone else? Uh, yes. Uh, continuation passing is something that was developed um, with Scheme. And it's a way of, of uh, you express a context as a function, and you can pass that along. And so um, you've got a, a thread of execution in which functions never return, that they're always going forward um, and, and passing along the function that should return, the, that should uh, be given the result of the computation so far. And so it's always going forward. And because it never returns, eventually you'll, you'll, have, you'll ex exceed the stack. Um, so in order to, to make that work, you need to be free of the stack. And the tail recursion optimization or proper tail calls accomplish that. Um, so I, I'm not certain that it's appropriate for all applications. But for some of the stuff, particularly some of the server side stuff that we're looking at, where you get these really convoluted nesting of you know, this callback and that one and that one, having continuation passing would be another set of tools that you would have for managing that complexity. Um, it's something that we've talked about in, in TC39, which is the ECMAScript uh, committee. The, the trade-off here, and it, uh, we should talk about this, um, because uh, in certain cases, we don't have to remember a, uh, a a stack trace going backwards, debugging becomes more difficult because you'll get to some place in the debugger and you can't see how you got there because we're not tracking that information anymore. Um, so that's a trade-off. Some people have suggested, well, you just turn that off while you're debugging, but that means any algorithm that would fail without tail recursion would fail when you're debugging, and so that doesn't actually solve anything. So it's a hard trade-off. Um, and up until this point, we've decided uh, not to do it. Now, it might be that being aware that this is going on, a smart debugger could, instead of relying on the stack to keep its state, could be doing something else instead. And so it's not necessarily a, a hard trade-off. Um, but at this point, the people who are most opposed to it are browser makers. Um, God, probably because uh, they can't determine what the cost of that's going to be to them. Uh, you? Yeah. yeah. JavaScript is moving beyond its role as the language of the browser to be the language of the browser and the server. And the synergies that will be available to the development community, I think, will be significant. Yes. Uh, the thing I would like to change about HTML5 is I think they should have corrected the cross-site scripting hazard before adding powerful new capabilities. So in my view, HTML5 makes the problem worse in three ways. That it um, increases the attack surface um, because it's huge and complicated. Anytime you have something that's huge and complicated and new, that means that there are more places that the attackers can figure out to, to get at and, and cause harm. Uh, the second is that even using the existing attacks, 
uh, which we saw Twitter taken down last week, right? So this is still an ongoing problem. Um, the attacker now gets powerful new capabilities. They get access to your local database now, and they, there's no restriction on what they can do to that database. That's huge. Uh, they now have new tools for getting out to the network and, and causing greater damage behind the firewall or wherever else, and that's huge. And then the third is, because HTML5 is so big and complicated and, and fuzzy, uh, it may take years before it's finished. And I think we have to wait for that until we can get to a correct solution. Um, so it's postponing doing the right thing in, in addition to doing the wrong thing. Um, that said, there are a lot of good ideas in HTML5, and it, it's nice that we're moving the web forward. But I think they got their priorities wrong. And they're doing things out of order. It's really um, attractive to add shiny new features to a system. It's much harder to correct the fundamental problems in a system. And they chose not to do that. And I think that was a tragic mistake. Uh, yes? Oh, thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. And, and, yeah. and I do very much hope that IBM or that Microsoft, excuse me, does do the right thing um, on this. That, in particular, ECMAScript 5 isn't a standard that was forced on Microsoft, as much like pretty much all of HTML5 was. That Microsoft actually participated in TC39. Right, was uh, helped design uh, ECMAScript 5. Uh, Microsoft was the editor of the ECMAScript 5 standard. Microsoft voted yes at the General Assembly. Um, I would like for Microsoft to follow through on, on their development and good work on ECMAScript 5. Thank you. Okay, uh, I think we're, okay. we're good with, okay. the, with the questions now. We've got to move on. Well, Doug will be around so you can ask him more questions later. Um, Thank you, Doug. That was wonderful. Thank you.